Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to work with this group, both with International Neuroethics Society and certainly with Brain Matters. One of the things that we've been working on for about the past four to six years is the whole thrust of neuroscience and neurotechnology into potential agendas of public safety and national security. But you know the names. Columbine, Newtown, Oslo, Boston, as far back as even perhaps 9-11, if one were to look at that as a public security ish. And not an event like this goes by where literally phone does not ring. And somebody says, you, neuroscientist type, you, neuroethicist, can't you do something? Can't you utilize this science and technology in a way that is predictive, if not preventive and interventional, or at least to mitigate these potential harms? These are the challenge statements I have before you. How does the brain function in cognition, emotion, and behavior? We recognize this. This could probably be the basement statement that launches the pediment upon which any investigation of neuro s &T could be examined. How can these mechanisms be assessed or accessed? And moreover, how can we operationalize these? And from this, we then contextualize this into whence public safety. Can we engage these things in ways that are going to protect the polis? And more than not, what we're seeing is it's not a question of, well, just one form of neuroimaging or just neurogenomics or perhaps just some form of computational algorithm that allies upscale comparative indices, but harnessing all of these together under a rubric known as interventional or integrative scientific convergence, ISC. There's the idea of we really want protection and very often we'll turn to neuroscience as the public as well as many policy types and politicians and those in public safety do and say, do something. But if we say, yes, we can do something, and we can do it in this way, well, they say, well, X, Y, and Z may not, in fact, be legal or may have a very high U factor, and that's what we call street corner ethics. Uh, we can assess everybody from birth periodically and begin to track their trends utilizing this type of notogram, as I showed you, and that may be very useful. And they go, Ew, you really want it? You can't do that. So it's the cake and eat it, too. Privacy, protection. Protection, perhaps, not only from those things that go bump in the night that affect our public safety, but then is the deliver us from evil really the evil of utilizing neurotechnology in potentially inapt or illegal ways? And what does that mean? Is it mitigating these types of harms or manipulating the brain? Is this validity? Is this reliability? And what level of accessibility and admissibility into the court? Extant standards, for example, that we use in the United States, the Fry standard and the somewhat more stringent Daubert standard, have indeed been questioned with regard to whether or not these truly represent the level of scientific legitimacy to say this is valid, this is not. And then, of course, you have to ask, well, in what culture? For, for what ends? How might these be used, misused, or even abused? And let me go one step further. Although we might be able to say that within the confines, for example, of public safety parameters, we might be able to say that there are indeed local and national laws that would define, restrict, constrain, guide the way neuroscience and neurotechnology can and perhaps should be used. These are also working upon civil laws. What happens, for example, if we nationally and internationally literally declare a war on violence. Does that then open the potential to utilize a very different set of potential legal and ethical norms, such as jus ad bellum, jus in bello, or new concept, jus contra bellum, which is justification so as to prevent an escalation of violence? And once we say this is, in fact, some type of legally declared, quote, war, do we then see these not necessarily as just tools, but perhaps in the strictest sense, neuroweapons? Not in a devastating or destructive way, but perhaps in a way that avoids violence, tries to sustain a good. We look to neuroscience and neurotechnology in this rather contentious, if not provocative, field of public safety and national security via its Venusian visage. The potential for utopian possibilities. Can we eliminate, can we prevent, can we mitigate these types of horrific acts of violence and do so in a way that really upholds the obligation of the politic to protect the polis? Or is this something far more dystopian? Is this something, for example, Big Brother-esque? And in so doing, are we trading one set of evils for the other? Well, these are the realities. They are not necessarily either or. They are indeed both end. Neuroethics assumes a stance of preparedness and not just a frank precautionary principle. Science and technology will move on because A, there is the drive to do that, and B, there is the pull from society to do that. 
This is how I see the neuroethics and perhaps neuroethical legal social address of these issues of public safety, as well as perhaps any other. It fosters the neuroethical issues that arise from the science and tech. It addresses these issues. It plots current and perhaps future trajectories through viable modeling, engaging this in both a qualitative and quantitative way. It informs guidelines, policies, and laws through sensitivity and reflexivity. But then we have to define what that good is. Is that creating this type of a neurotopia? This actually comes from the movie Minority Report, where you have the Department of Pre-Crime. Can we utilize neuroscience and neurotechnology in those ways so as to model potentially predictive interventional steps to say these individuals have a high probabilistic likelihood for X, Y, and Z, and as such, we can intervene now because of that probability? In many ways, this sort of reminds me of the old Monty Python skit. I'm not dead yet, yet, but you will be. I've not committed a crime yet, yeah, but your brain says you might. Then let's re-examine what technology really is. It's technologos. It's a rational accounting of tools and those who use them. In fact, we have to see how will we use these tools. We've offered some possibilities. The use of assessment neurotech in certain cases that have been identified to then monitor the progress of these individuals. Perhaps the use of assessment convergent approaches to increase the focus of surveillance and perhaps conserve resources that may be used for public safety. Revisitation of certain legal standards. We've talked about whether or not the Daubert standard is viable and stringent enough, or maybe we need some others. And we've entertained the Federal Evidence Registry 403, for example, as a possibility. And also the use of neuroscience and technology interventionally. But danger here, great danger. Because then we have to ask, what are we really doing? How are we using this? Are we, in fact, going down yet another slippery slope where we're then politicizing science underneath false agenda? And this is a level of control that takes us into what may be very, very Machiavellian ends. So towards this end, please remember that neuroscience and technology are human endeavors for human endeavor. We control the vertical. We control the horizontal, if you will. And that is a discourse that exists with each and all of you. Thanks for your time.